Welcome back to the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, the Indo-Pacific, and the fate of the 21st century. I'm your host, Misha Oslin, and today I am very happy to be joined by a former colleague and old friend of mine, Sadaranan Dume, who is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., sad to his friends, of which I count myself as one, uh, is an expert on India and South Asia. He writes about South Asian political economy, foreign policy, business, society, uh, focusing primarily on India, but also Pakistan. He is, for many of you who read the Wall Street Journal, you already know this, he is a South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, his prior life, uh, he was a correspondent, a foreign correspondent for the Far Eastern Economic Review in India and Indonesia. Uh, and his book, My Friend the Fanatic, Travels with a Radical Islamist, was published in four languages, a study of radical Islam in Indonesia. So, Sad Dume, my old friend, welcome to the Pacific Century. Thanks, Misha. Good to be here. So, we don't do as much as I'd like to on the podcast about India, and so this is one attempt of one of, of many that will be coming up to uh, to correct that and and talk about the world's largest democracy, uh, the world's second or soon to be largest uh, populated country, uh, a critical part of uh, American foreign policy, uh, increasingly of Japanese foreign policy, of course within the ambit of South Asia, the, the 800 pound elephant, uh, if we can use that term. Um, but for a lot of people who may not have paid that much attention to India until recently, it is becoming known uh, because of the crisis in Ukraine, perhaps uh, somewhat unexpectedly. And it's becoming known because unlike the United States, uh, most of Europe, uh, Japan, uh, and other countries with whom India has had increasingly closer relations over the past decade or so, India seems to be straddling the fence on, her, on uh, Ukraine, if not um, actively supporting Russia. Is that, is that a fair assessment? And if it is, why? Uh, that's a great question. And I think that the Indian response to uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which I would describe as studied neutrality, uh, has come as a surprise to one set of observers and it has been no surprise at all to another set of observers. I think people who are not really uh, experts on India and who have viewed India and the US coming together, uh, coming closer together over the past 20 years and particularly over the last 10 years uh, in many, many ways. You've, you've seen the trade relationship boom, you see the defense relationship grow, growing deeper, you've seen the quad, uh, revived since 2017 and so on, they sort of had begun to slot India uh, in a place that is similar to the way they slot, say, South Korea or Japan, you know, traditional American treaty allies in, in, in Asia. And so when they found that, the, that, the, that New Delhi was unwilling to condemn the Russian invasion, was, uh, was uh, neutral at the, at the United Nations, abstained in the, in the, in the, in the General Assembly, uh, along with China and, and about, 30, about 35 other countries. And this came as a surprise because it seemed to cut against the dominant view of India and India's place in, 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 in the, in the Indo-Pacific. But if you talk to people who have um, followed Indian foreign policy closely over the years, this was much less of a surprise. Uh, India has what it calls a special and privileged partnership with Russia. Uh, India was, of course, a, an ally of the Soviet Union in the, in, 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 during the Cold War. And even though India-Russia relations have weakened considerably compared to then, and India, um, in my view, tilts much more firmly towards the US than it does toward any other country, um, for various reasons, India is, willing to, uh, is unwilling to let go of the relationship with Russia. And if I had to summarize this very quickly for your listeners, I would say that um, the most important reason is that India remains, we can sort of unpack all of these uh, at length later, but let me just quickly summarize. Um, the most important would be that India remains uh, dependent to a large degree on Russian arms, both in terms of volume and in terms of certain particular high, high technology purchases. There is a 
fear in India that, in fact, the same reason that India has been driven towards a closer relationship with the US, a uh, fear of a rising and revanchist China, also uh, keeps India tethered to the Russians because India doesn't, would, li- would not like to see Russia become even closer to Beijing than it has been. There is a certain amount of nostalgia, particularly, I think, among older foreign policy thinkers, uh, sort of for the old days when, you know, Moscow's veto was always there to sort of, you know, to, to bail India out every time there was, a, you know, a, 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 some kind of an awkward discussion about Kashmir at the UN and so on. So the, the and, and then there is the ideological element, which is that India wants to see a multipolar world in which it is one of the poles. And so to that extent, it is, you know, not a kind of, uh, it is not a natural partner when it comes to uh, upholding the existing liberal international order, um, at least when it comes to a challenge from Russia. It is much more of a partner when that challenge comes from China, but that's because India itself has its very deep, profound problems with China. So I've had to sort of summarize that that's, that's, that's why India has been, uh, has not come out against uh, Russia. Uh, in reality, though, I think India is, you know, I don't think India is going to affect um, the outcome of this conflict in any significant way. So we can get into more of that as we speak. Well, that's a great uh, summary. I mean, extremely concise and, and incisive. And before we start to unpack some of it, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the India-Russia relationship, um, which does go back, you know, to talk a little bit about the history. Um, there is, uh, I would say, some perspective, uh, again, rightly or wrongly, that particularly right now at this, this moment of, of uh, supporting, or, or at least as you put it, studied neutrality towards Russia, is really a preference of Narendra Modi, the prime minister who's been in power since 2014. Um, he's known for having had, of course, a strong relationship with former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. We'll talk about Japan a later, a little bit later. Um, uh, it had a strong relationship with Prime Minister, uh, with President Trump, former President Trump, and this is often uh, portrayed in, you know, in the press as these are just strong men who like each other. And so the the current view is, well, this is a strong man who likes Putin. Is there any weight to to be given to that interpretation, or is it as you've uh, you, you laid out? It's really this is much more traditional Indian foreign policy. So I, yeah, so I disagree with that interpretation. I, I think it's uh-huh. certainly true that uh, in many ways Modi does resemble other populist strongmen. Um, there are very striking similarities between Modi, both in terms of his uh, politics and his background. Uh, if you sort of compare him with, say, someone like Viktor Orban in Hungary or uh, Erdogan in Turkey um, and many other strongman figures. I think the, the comparisons with some of uh, with Trump uh, is sort of overdrawn, but there are many there are there are many similarities. Um, and it's also certainly true that there's a subsection of Modi supporters and some of them are very vocal on social media who are, in fact, great admirers of Putin. Uh, when the conflict started for a while, uh, I stand with Putin was trending on Twitter in India. And they are uh, fans of Putin for similar reasons. I mean, these, you see these reasons and, you know, elements of the you know, American conservative movement too, right? That, you know, Putin is seen as this tough guy and he has no, no time for the excesses of Western liberalism. And uh, he, you know, he, he, he is a person who can, show people their place and all of that. Um, um, but I don't think that this is what drives uh, Modi's policy. This is something that is a constant. This is something I can't imagine that a Congress party led government, which would be different from a Modi, the Modi government uh, in many ways. I don't think their policy towards Russia would be different. So, um, so oh, yeah, go ahead, please. So, and I think the it, you know, I, the, and the the most important element of it is that the things I, I outlined um, is that India is in a very tough situation with China. There's been a border conflict which erupted in violence two years ago. The Chinese seem unwilling to give up some of the uh, gains that they have made, in fact, on the ground on their undemarcated boundary line. 
And the simple fact is that the Indian army relies to a very large extent on Russian arms and spare parts. And there is a fear that if the Russians were to squeeze India, uh, it would really make India's situation on that boundary, which is a live boundary, uh, with China untenable. And this is a reality that any government would have to face. Um, beyond that, you've got the fact that there is this real consensus in India that, you know, seeking a multipolar world and so on. And one of the things that's quite interesting about India, and which is where it's, you know, I'd say different from the US and the West, is that in the Indian imagination, Russia remains a great power. And that just is fixed. And it's very hard to get people to, uh, to even imagine the idea that there could be a world where Russia is not just not a great power, but is, is utterly diminished and does not have uh, the wherewithal to really affect uh, global events in an important way. Um, so that would, that, that's almost unthinkable thought for many people in India. And this idea that Russia is a great power is widely shared. And so is the idea that sort of follows from that, which is that because Russia is a great power, it will never truly be subservient to Russia. And if only the West were a little bit more reasonable towards the Russians, we could peel the Russians away from the Chinese, which would be the ideal situation for India. And this is something that it's obviously, there are some people who don't agree with this, but I'd say that there's a, there is a large degree of consensus on this question in Indian foreign policy circles. So that's fascinating. So is this now, is this shared as well by younger Indian policy, foreign policy analysts and, and policymakers as, as well as those who were around during the Cold War and active? Is it, do you see it, um, do you see it shifting in any way? Obviously for the West, uh, you know, in many ways, the attack on Ukraine has been a, uh, a totally unexpected wake up to, let's say, the nature of, uh, of Russia, but also that Russia continues within the European sphere to be a significant, I don't know if we want to call it a great power, but a significant power. But for for 30 years before that, we had dismissed Russia as a great power. We had ignored it. Um, so is this, is this shared widely, this view of Russia across both the political spectrum and the age spectrum in India? And, and if so, I mean, you've, you, you've said it. I'm just wondering if, if, if you can sort of understand, if you can tell us more why, why would the Indians, as they've seen a world in which China has risen, uh, and most of Asia has risen. They've seen a, an EU that has obviously come together in many ways over the past, you know, since Maastricht in 1992. Um, why would they still be focused on Russia uh, when that seems to be of a prior era? Um, I think everyone is focused on Russia right now because of the war. And I don't think that the Indians before this were particularly focused on Russia. It's just that they have a, a view of Russia um, that is, I think, different from the view that we have over here. To answer the age question, I'd say the, big, the biggest difference is that the, the younger people have less of a sense of nostalgia, mm -hmm. right? They're sort of, but I think Indians view are very sort of, they are, at least if you look at the public discourse, right? How people discuss these things on television and on uh, podcasts and on uh, social media and so on. Um, Indians talk all the time about the Russian support for India in 1971 in the war with you know, the war that, with Pakistan that led to the creation of Bangladesh. They speak all the time about U.S. perfidy in 1971, right? the U.S. being on the side of Pakistan. Now, this sort of to us when we're having this discussion, this seems like you know almost ancient history. Like, why would anyone talk about 1971? But that's just not how they think of history that's not how they think of these things i also think that the you know what you what you have in india particularly with the rise of the bjp is a, and and this is often not unpacked but it's 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 it seems to be there as an undercurrent which is is a great degree of sympathy of this with this idea of a civilizational state Very um, i was just reading some of the you know russian russian the, the russian thinker alexander dugan and he had a piece a few years ago that was published in an Indian, one of these think magazines. And I was struck by how he was, he sort of was, you know, packaging his, uh, his, his philosophy um, in a way that would be appealing to Indians. 
So I don't think a lot of people spend, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not as though your ordinary sort of regular person spends a lot of time, you know, thinking about what Alexander Dugan thinks. <laughs> but I do think that there is a kind of, um, the, let, me, let me put it this way. The way that many Indians view India as a civilizational state that is destined to be an important pole in global politics is strikingly similar to how I think some of the Russians view Russia. That is that is great. We should note for, for listeners who may not be as conversant in uh, Indian politics, the BJP is uh, Narendra Modi's party, the, the Hindu Nationalist Party, uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, uh, and the opposition party, the long ruling Congress party, which is the party of, of the Gandhis, of, of uh, Indira Gandhi and, and Rajiv Gandhi. Um, so actually, let's, let's talk, if we can, a, a, a little bit about this fascinating idea of the, the polls and that you've, you've brought up sort of the geopolitics here of, the, of, of what India sees uh, as polls in a civilizational state. Can you, can you uh, unpack that a little bit? What, what is a civilizational state? Why does it matter? And who are the other civilizational states that India is seeing around it? Uh, and, and what is its view? What are the polls? What is the view ultimately of this desired uh, geopolitical equilibrium that India would like to see? So there are two separate things, right? The, the, there's a consensus view across the political divide that India that should be an important player, a leading power in the world. That's the, 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 the term they use. And this is true regardless. The, I mean, Manmohan Singh has made this point, the previous prime minister who was the Congress prime minister and Modi has made this point. This is not something that is, uh, that this is not ideological. Uh, and if you look at what the, and the polls would be, the, the US would obviously be one of them. And uh, China was emerging as another poll. Uh, Russia would be another one, maybe the EU, India, possibly Japan. That would perhaps sort of sum it up, right? The, which, who, which, which would, who are the major centers of power in the world? And India, because of its size, because it's the second most populous nation in the world, uh, because it's got a young population, the economy has been growing reasonably well for the last 30 years and so on, certainly sees itself as aspiring to that position. Now, we can have a separate debate about whether the, how realistic that aspiration is given current realities, but that is a widely shared aspiration. Uh, and the fear that India has is the fear of China's rise is that, the, that, that we could end up, in fact, with a, a bipolar world, that a, a G2, and that India would be stuck and would be forced to choose. India doesn't like choosing and so on. So that's the sort of question of multipolarity. The question of a civilizational state is uh, much more fraught. Over there, there is not that much consensus in India. It's the, the Hindu nationalists who tend to view India in those terms. And so they would take the, they would say that, yes, of course, there should be a multipolar world and India should be uh, one of the poles. But then, then they would add the idea that India should be one of those poles because it represents one of the world's major religions and an ancient, ancient Hindu civilization that has much wisdom to offer the world. So Sad, can you tell me a little bit more about how Indian foreign policy thinkers and, and policymakers view this, this multipolar world? Do they see all the poles as equal, uh, equally powerful and equidistant so that there's a balance? Do they see an alignment amongst the poles or, or, or parts of the poles? Obviously during the Cold War, uh, the non-alignment uh, foreign policy of, of started by Prime Minister uh, Nehru, which the founder of the Congress party and first prime minister of the Congress party was sort of what marked Indian foreign policy, the Americans thought during the Cold War. And that's, that's changed. So I'm just wondering, as they look, as they talk about the polls, how do they view them sort of operationalized? And then what does that mean for the foreign policy that they're following? So, you know, there's, there's divergence on this. Like a few years ago, a prominent journalist wrote a book where he sort of argued that there would be three major powers, which would be the US, China, and India. Some people view this, like I said earlier, um, many in terms of more polls. I think the sort of the, the, the dominant view is that uh, 
China should not be allowed to be a hegemonic power in Asia. And this is really also what's been, as you know so well, Misha, driving so much uh, cooperation between the US and India. So there is a sense definitely that the Chinese pole would be antagonistic towards India um, for various reasons. I mean, the most obvious reason, of course, is that there's a territorial dispute but beyond Can you talk a little that, bit about you, that, actually? Do you, do you mind yeah. sort of inserting uh, so people who may not have followed what the territorial dispute is? We should note, of course, there was a, a major war between India and China in 1962 up in the Himalayas. So what, what is the border dispute? And I don't want to knock you off of this poll thing, but maybe just to, to get people caught up with you here. Only undemar- major undemarcated land boundary that China has is with India. And this, of course, goes back to the colonial era, where the lines of the map that were drawn by the British when India was part of the British Raj are disputed by the Chinese. And the Indians and the Chinese have, despite dozens of rounds of talks, not been able to come up with an agreement on where exactly the boundary lies. And where roughly is this? This is in the Himalayas. And so this is across, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, 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 all, all the way across. So for example, the Chinese occupy um, an area called uh, Aksai Chin, which they seized by force, which is depicted in all Indian maps as a part of India, has in fact, it is, it, it is in fact with China. China occupies about 20% of the state of the pro- Jammu and Kashmir, the province, what the former Indian province of Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Some of this was ceded to it by Pakistan. The Chinese claim the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh, which is in India's Northeast. They call that South Tibet. So these sort of, there's, there are, there are territorial claims that the Chinese make on territory that India says is Indian territory. And the Chinese claim that this was never Indian territory. And this was a land grab essentially by the Raj. So that comes down, that's the territorial part of it. But some Indian thinkers, in fact, there's a new book by a former Indian foreign, foreign secretary and very perceptive um, foreign policy thinker who sort of talks about something deeper, which is that the Chinese do not really respect the Indians. And this is something that uh, you do have more Indian foreign policy thinkers talking about that, that the antagonism goes beyond the boundary issue The boundary question is one, is sort of one large element, the fact that the two countries have not been able to get over this. But beyond that, what India uh, would really like is for the Chinese to treat them, if not as a peer, um, at least as a near peer. And the Indians would not have no problem acknowledging that China, that China, China, China is tradition and a muscular power, but they want the Chinese to have sort of acknowledge some of that in return. And the Chinese really don't seem to have any, any interest in that. Uh, uh, and and in, in some, so the, all, out of these polls, bringing it back to the polls, there is clear antagonism, uh, if not hostility, uh, that the Indians see the Chinese expressing towards them. The, and so that kind of naturally places India, uh, it, you know, it, it creates a convergence between India and the West. But even with the West, particularly with the rise of Hindu nationalism in India, there are uh, constraints and challenges because uh, the Hindu nationalists are not really very comfortable with many elements of liberalism. And so you've seen, you know, an erosion in many of many uh, basic rights in India, particularly minority rights. So we can, I mean, that's, that's a sort of longer conversation perhaps for another time. <clears throat> But by and large, if you had to quickly sort of summarize it, you would just sort of see the, the, the view from New Delhi is that the future is going to be multipolar. India is going to be one of the important poles alongside the US and China. And India's interests are not aligned with China's interests. They're not perfectly aligned with America's interests, but India and the US share an interest in ensuring that China does not become a hegemon in Asia. So one of the... Uh the concerns that that I've heard expressed uh, by Indians over um, or Indian thinkers over China's rise and and China's expansion 
uh, uh, to use a, an old American phrase, one is, one is by land and two is by sea. The first one being the, the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative that, that crosses Eurasia, actually reaches all the way uh, into Europe, but which India, as I understood, sees as, as coming into areas where it has, has preferred to have influence and, and also just simply it worries about being locked out of some of these trade and, and development agreements. Um, and the second is is by sea that as the uh, as the Chinese Navy in particular expands its reach throughout the Indian Ocean, obviously has a base in Djibouti now, uh, and uses that to to extend influence actually all the way into the Atlantic. Um, that India, which has seen the Indian Sea, the Indian Ocean really as its own, uh, now feels uh, challenged. There are are these are these uh, accurate assessments or. Um, are, are these areas of contention between Beijing and New Delhi? Well, for sure. Now, I mean, to, you know, we were talking about Russia a, a little bit earlier, but to use a, a, a Russian term, <clears throat> India views m- much of South Asia as it's near abroad. Mm-hmm. And India has traditionally had great sway and continues to have great sway in places like Sri Lanka, and Nepal, the Maldives. And in all of these countries, you have seen the Chinese make enormous inroads. And the fact is that India and China are not uh, sort of comparable economically at this moment. You know, as recently as 1990, per capita income in India and China was roughly roughly the same. Uh, Right now, it is more than five and a half times greater in China than in India. So the Chinese economy has grown much, much more rapidly. And so the Indians find themselves really playing defense. And from an, in an ideal world, from an Indian perspective, they'd be able to stabilize the situation, focus on their own economy, and close the gap with China. But in, in today's world, what they see happening every single day Uh, is the Chinese reaching into areas that India has long viewed as its own sphere of influence. Uh, Belt and Road is part of it. The formal Indian objection was to the fact that part of it passed through uh, part of Kashmir, which is controlled by Pakistan, but claimed by India. So it sort of directly violates India's territorial integrity. But the larger underlying concern and the reason why India did not participate in the Belt and Road Initiative, and in fact was the first major country to call it out publicly, uh, was because uh, it has been uh, increasing Chinese influence in many of these areas, including, uh, I think, the uh, most prominently in Sri Lanka. So that that brings me to a question about the the Indian reaction to what China is doing and the Quad. Um, Obviously, we've talked, I think, Rip, you know, fascinating, uh, explanation of how India thinks about poles and the poles that it that it sees the world uh, breaking into, but it has joined uh, at least one of those poles and 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 possibly a second pole in the quad, meaning the United States, of course, as well as Japan, uh, Australia, a wonderful country. I don't think well, it would be necessarily considered a pole, uh, but um, where does the quad fit into Indian foreign policy? How important is it to New Delhi to Americans who? are uh, sympathetic to the idea of a, of a new grouping of, of significant liberal powers. Uh, you know, the Quad is sort of a great hope for counterbalancing China, but also promoting uh, a more liberal Asia. Is, is that the same view in New Delhi? Do they see it more transactionally? Do they see it more narrowly? What is the Indian view of the Quad? Why are they in it? What do they want to get out of it? I think they would agree with the first half and not with the second half. I think that they would agree that China needs to be balanced, and particularly in recent years, as being um, seeing Chinese aggression uh, from an Indian perspective. And in many ways, what the Chinese have been doing in the Himalayas is quite similar to what they've been doing in the South China Sea. And so there's a sort of uh, there's a there's a there's definitely a very strongly shared concern over there. Salami slicing over territory, basically. Exactly. So the way it's sort of the same way they've been building these islands and so on, they've just been salami slicing across along the boundary with India quite successfully. They're just changing facts on the ground and they're saying, well, you know, your, your troops used to patrol over here, guess what, until two years ago. And well, now they can't. And you know, just too bad. 
And that's, that's, that's what the Chinese have been doing. And the Indians are sort of, you know, are very keenly aware of, 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 what, of, the, of how China has been behaving. I don't think that they view, and if you sort of look at the kinds of things that the Quad has been doing, they've been doing things like vaccines, they've been doing things like, you know, uh, trying to uh, reach out together to the ASEAN countries by playing to the sort of strengths of the four members. Uh, there really isn't much of a values component to it. Mm -hmm. And um, in fairness, this is something, you know, the Indians have always been a little bit shy about um, exporting liberal values, even when arguably India was doing a better job of adhering to these values itself. But um, now in many ways, I think the, the values part is the part that we in the quad is it's, it's papered over somewhat right and the way it's papered over is just to sort of just declare that well you know these are four liberal democracies but if you literally look at sort of talk to the people who uh look at democracy very closely uh including your your colleague uh larry diamond uh, i think it's quite questionable about whether india is in fact a liberal democracy at this point it is definitely a robust electoral democracy people vote in large numbers um, Modi is a popular prime minister. Let's just let's, let's not let's not get this wrong. But if by liberal democracy we mean a commitment to uh, to checks and balances on power, a commitment to minority rights, a commitment to religious freedom, a commitment to the idea of equality before the law, a commitment to the idea of a free media, uh, then it becomes much more questionable. But I think in this case, the U.S. has shown, as of the Japanese and the Australians that the geopolitics comes first and that it, India is too large and too important a, a power for, it to, for us to sort of allow some of the disagreements or some of the concerns we may have about the drift towards a more illiberal direction to overcome what are the sort of the geopolitical gains of having India in the tent. So it brings me to Japan then, a, a country that India has developed a relationship with, especially over the past decade, or so, uh, much more than it ever had. And uh, a Japan that, interestingly, at the same time, has actually become much more uh, forthright about talking about liberal values, precisely because it's counterposing itself to China in Asia. It talks about the promotion of liberal values and obviously respect for sovereignty and respect for international law and norms uh, and the like. Um, how, how close are India and Japan? How significant, from the Indian perspective, and how significant is this relationship? And again, what, what does India hope to get out of it? Is it balancing China? Is it, is it trade? What is it? It's very close. And I think that uh, the India-Japan relationship is really one of those understudied relationships. And, and there are very few countries in the world that have as much influence on India as the Japanese do. Hmm. And some of this is uh, some of this is uh, economic. Um, obviously, the Japanese are in a position to uh, invest uh, in India. Um, they are uh, they are they are in a position to supply India with some of the technology that it needs. But it also kind of meshes very well with this rise of uh, civilizational consciousness in India. The Indians view the the Japanese as the kind of kindred. They view the, they think of, because of you know, Buddhism and so on, they... Which is interesting because one, one's a subcontinent with a billion people and one's islands with, you know, shrinking 120 million. Yeah, but they view them as, and they view the sort of, the, you know, the, the, they, they, they like the sort of low-key Japanese style of diplomacy. Japanese are never going to publish some report criticizing India about how it's treating its Muslim minority. Uh, it's just sort of, so even though the Japanese may be um, framing this more as a contest between an autocracy and a liberal democracy, when if you look at how they engage with India, they really aren't putting the values piece of it front and center, at least to the extent of, you know, it's not as though they are being critical. Uh, maybe, I, I'm not sure you, you're, you'd be better positioned to tell me whether they have private concerns but they certainly don't have any uh, public concerns on this score. So in many ways, you know, Japan is, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's very influential in India and uh, there is a kind of strong sense that the, in India and Japan are 
uh, on the same page. Um, in fairness, again, this is something that predates the rise of Modi. The previous government also, um, and, and you know, had a and 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 then a lot of the initiative has, in fact, come from um, Abe. I think Abe was, you know, you know better than than me. Um, in the many ways in which you could argue that he's a transformational figure, but I would say that in terms of the India-Japan relationship, he really did, um, you know, uh, increase the importance of India in Japanese thinking. And the Indians, of course, have been very, very receptive to this. Uh, has there been any, um, uh, one, one last question on the India-Japan uh, side of it. Um, has there been any tension that you've picked up because of the two having rather different, again, approaches to Ukraine? The, the Japanese have been fully in the U.S. camp, levied sanctions, condemned the invasion. Um, you know, they're, they're, again, you know, the days of sort of waffling on these questions in Japan appears to be over. Uh, versus where the Indians are, have, is, has that uh, driven any daylight between them, or or is it? It's just not that important in terms of the Indo-Japanese relationship, Ukraine. I think the Indians have calculated and calculated correctly that as long as they are on board in the Indo-Pacific, and as long as they are on board with larger concerns that they share with. The other quad countries on China, they are effectively going to be given a free pass on Russia. That is the that in a nutshell is their calculation. Um, some people would argue that they've miscalculated. There was an interesting piece by Lisa Curtis in uh, Foreign Affairs the other day, where she sort of argued that the longer India sits on the fence on this question, the harder it'll be for it to sort of maintain this uh, this balancing act. But that certainly does not seem to be the view in India. I think they feel that they have, they have pulled this off. They are able to main, continue to not condemn Russia uh, by increasing amounts of oil from Russia, uh, not sever the arms relationship, though that has, in fact, on, in any case, been declining over the over years, and it is will probably continue to decline. But essentially, that they can continue to maintain a close relationship with Moscow, while at the same time deepening their relationship with the U.S. and the Quad countries. And in that way, I think India sort of sees itself as a pretty unique. And uh, my own sense is that their calculation has been correct at least so far. So let's. That's a, a great segue to talk about the U.S. Um, where does the relationship with the U.S. stand? Uh, during the George W. Bush years, uh, there was a, uh, a, you know, a sort of epical change, I think it's fair to say, in U.S.-India relations. Uh, the civil nuclear uh, agreement um, uh, just expanded ties, uh, expanded military uh, discussions and, and, and different types of cooperation, naval exercises such as Malabar. Uh, my sense, I don't know if it's, if it's accurate, my sense uh, from being in Washington uh, is that the Obama years sort of saw a cooling off of that. I wouldn't, I won't say a cooling, but it sort of seems like a, a bit of a slowdown. Uh, Trump obviously had uh, a close relationship with Modi. So India sort of came back and then you had the quad revived. Uh, and now Biden's, you know, taking the quad even to a higher level with the, with the leaders meeting. So where, um, where does it stand between the, uh, the Indians and uh, the Americans? Are, are we, are we allies? Not not treaty allies, but are we allies? Are we partners? Do we have a strategic relationship? How would you classify it? I think we're officially strategic partners. Strategic. Everyone's a strategic partner. People love the word strategic. Everyone's a strategic partner. I'd love to sort of see a relationship between two countries where they say we're partners, but not strategic. I'm totally we're with unstrategic. you. We, we, we are tactical partners, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're ad hoc. We, to see we, that. we sort of on Tuesdays, yeah. we, we think a little bit more. And I know it's crazy. Everyone's a strategic partner. Um, so the relationship, you know, I sort of divide that into two parts. If you look at the government to government relationship, it's strong, uh, particularly in the realm of defense. And it has been getting stronger. You're absolutely right to sort of it starts with George W. Bush, but I'd say subsequent sub, subsequent uh, administrations have um, built upon that momentum. And India sort of has been, you know, there's been a bipartisan consensus. Uh, if you talk to Republicans and you talk to Democrats, maybe not for all, entirely the same reasons, but they have both seen the logic of uh, deepening relations with India. 
And that logic has not been diluted over time, uh, particularly as the consensus view in Washington on China um, has emerged that there's sort of that, that there's there's just much less optimism, and there are just many few people who you know argue that China is about to become democratic as it becomes more prosperous and so on. And so that and so the the U.S. India relationship, government to government ties, is is, is strong. Uh, where there are frictions is more in terms of civil society, media, and so on. And the Indians don't always, I mean, I think the diplomats, professionals understand that these are not the same thing, but um, there's an element of public opinion, which is, uh, you know, sort of, of the, is, con- tends to sort of confuse these things. So, you know, the, every time the New York Times writes a scathing editorial about Modi, they were like, well, the Americans hate us. And they don't sort of make, <laughs> uh, make that distinction. So on on in, on on that front, I think that there have there are definitely concerns. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken just released a religious freedom report, which was quite scathing in terms of what's happening in India. And so I think that the 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 challenge has been for the Biden administration in particular has been to uh, balance these two things. The Trump administration were very clear. They were only interested in the geopolitics. They were very strong on deepening the defense relationship. They were, they did not really criticize India uh, in public. Uh, they, they kind of like left, left some of the uh, issues of illiberalism um, away. But for the Biden administration, this has become difficult because the Biden administration, you know, because of their own domestic agenda and the way they have framed their own, you know, uh, their 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 own uh, place in the world, uh, you know. You, for example, you have this democracy summit, and um, and and they have and to which India was invited, by the way. Mm-hmm. So that's where the tensions lie. But on the government to government side, it's been a, it's been quite strong. The economic relationship is much stronger than it was. Uh, bilateral trade is about one hundred and fifty billion dollars. Um, it used to be a fraction of that right. twenty years ago. Defense sales have gone from they were basically non-existent during the Cold War. Um, now I think cumulatively Indians have purchased more than twenty billion dollars worth of U.S. defense equipment. Sort of significant Indian capacity. So, for example, the heavy lift capacity of the Indian Air Force is now American. Um, so, in 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 and in, and in, you know even though some Indians have this sort of nostalgia for the Russians and so on. Um, I would say that the most reliable Indian vote for India in the United Nations Security Council on questions like Kashmir uh, would in fact be, be, be Washington and maybe followed by Paris. Hmm. So um, in, in, in many ways, this, the, the, so the relationship has been, uh, has, has been strong. And I think the biggest proof of this, bringing it back to where we began, is the fact that uh, India has managed to uh, weather the criticism of its position on Russia and Ukraine uh, quite well so far. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you think of another country that uh, would, you know, that has basically, that would have done what, what India has done, right? Not condemn Russia, up its oil purchases from Russia, uh, continue to maintain a uh, high level contact. And all the while, while, you know, being part of the quad, Modi meeting with Biden and so on. So they have, they, and the reason they've been able to do that in my view is that because the, they're, uh, they've managed to convince um, a successive administrations in the US, but including the Biden administration, that uh, the strategic relationship is really the most important part and that that boat should not be rocked because once you rock that boat, the stakes are so high in the Indo-Pacific that it's not worth it. That is a, a, you brought us back to the beginning. So I think it's a great place to end, but before I let you go, um, let me ask you what you're working on. You're working on a book. Yes, um, I'm working on a book on the rise of Hindu nationalism and India in the Modi years. And so it looks a, a lot of it sort of, it obviously it has implications for how the U.S. views India and U.S. India relations. But a lot of it is to do with, uh, is, is sort of looking at uh, how India itself is changing mm-hmm. uh, internally and, and what that means. Well, that's, that's great. I, I 
won't ask you when it's going to be out because I know that's the as an author, I know it's the worst question to ask an author of, of books, but I, uh, I certainly look forward to it. And, I, and when it's out, if not before then, uh, I hope you'll come back to, to talk more about this, maybe more on the domestic side, but this has just been a, a wonderful and fascinating conversation uh, with my friend Sadanan Dume, Sad Dume of the American Enterprise Institute. Sad, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Misha. It was a pleasure. Well, I'm Misha Oslin. You've been listening to The Pacific Century, and we will see you next time. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.